Well, praise the Lord, everybody. This is Apostle, and we're welcoming you all to our Thursday night Bible class. And we are ready to get back into the Word of God as we're dealing with prayer instructions. And today I want to share some things with you that I hope will help you in your prayer life. This is going to be a message that's going to go deep within our hearts. And we're going to have to do some searching within ourselves to see exactly where we are with the Lord. Because a lot of times we may think we're closer to God than we really are based off of uh, what we see other people doing. But we need to understand what does God have to say? What are his instructions to us? What is acceptable to him from us? And so this is where we're going to go today. And the reason why is because there is some powerful truths that he wants to share with us from his word. So let's just get right into the word tonight and see what the Holy Spirit has to say to us concerning his tremendous word. We're talking about the definition of prayer. And we're, we're also learning about the instructions of prayer. Now, the definition of prayer, this is um, message number three on this subject. And I want you to understand some things as we get into this, because God has got something that he wants us to, to understand. Uh, we're going to be talking about, watch this now, this is the definition of prayer. This is what we talked about before, where in Matthew 7, 7, Jesus said this. He said, ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find, knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone, do you see that everyone? For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you, whom if his son asks bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil or carnal, with a carnal nature, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? And so we found out that this is really what we're talking about, defi the definition of prayer, because what he talks about in prayer is we're communicating with God and he says something to us in verse seven. He says, ask and it shall be given. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened. And that's really defining prayer. We're asking, seeking and knocking. And these are the things that God wants us to do in order to find his will and to get him to answer our prayers. So that's what we talked about. And so uh, we're going to go on and see now the different types of prayer. Now we're going to talk about, because remember now we saw ask, seek, and knock. A-S-K. 
K. Ask, seek, knock. That's prayer. So now we want to talk to you tonight, and we're going to talk to you about the prayer of asking. There is what we call a prayer of asking. And so what we're going to find out here is how do we ask God for things and what are his requirements? I want you to understand something tonight, people of God. Everything that God promises us, he has requirements for us to meet. We must meet those requirements. And so it takes an introspective view of your own heart and an honest view of your own heart to determine where you are on the scale of submission to the Lord. Because we all must do a better job of submitting to the Lord. Remember, we have a sin nature on the inside of us. That sin nature is always working, trying to stop us from obeying God, trying to stop us from doing the things of God. And so it is important for you and it is important for me to make sure that we keep that sin nature crucified on the cross of Jesus. Actually crucified on our own personal cross. And so what we need to do is we need to check out ourselves and throw pride out of the window. And just get before the Lord and say, Lord, uh, examine my heart. Where am I on the scale of where you need for me to be so that I can be effective in my relationship with you? All of us need to grow in that area. There is not a person alive that does not need to grow in the area of submission to the Lord. And so we're going to see what God says to us as we get into this word. Praise God. So we're going to be talking about the prayer of asking. And this is very powerful because you're going to see some things that are that are really going to be revelatory to you. We're going to go to the book of St. John, chapter 15, and we're going to read verses four through seven. And in these verses, there is tremendous truth. So let's go. Faith, St. John chapter 15, verse 4 through 7. And the scripture reads as follows. This is Jesus talking, and he says, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered. And men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If, do you see that word there? If this is conditional. And I think many of us as Christians take that when we pray, God is just going to uh, just uh, arbitrarily answer everything that we pray because that's what he said. And since the Bible says God can't lie, then anytime I ask God for something, I'm supposed to get it. Well, hold on back up. Look at verse seven. If, so everything is contingent on you doing what's after if. He says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. So there is a qualifying statement here that we need to understand and we need to unravel. Because God makes a tremendously powerful statement. When he says, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. How many times have we asked what we will, but we haven't seen it done unto us yet? How many times have we prayed for things and it has not happened yet? Could it be that the reason that it has not happened 
It's not because God is, is working something out in us or God is allowing us to go through something so, to, so that we can grow. Could it possibly be that we're not abiding in him and his word is not abiding in us the way it should be so that it will cause him to answer our prayer? See, we need to listen and, and we need to understand. And the reason why I'm saying this is because Satan has launched an all out assault on the body of Christ. And this is an all out assault of absolute rebellion, hatred toward God, no fear of God, no reverence of God, no honor of God. And it goes from the, the, the ministry, the ministers in the ministry, all the way down to the congregation where God is not being honored and respected. And even Satan is being worshiped, even in the so-called houses of God. And people are interjecting their own opinions in things and their own ideas of what righteousness should be. And so what they're doing is they're they're stripping the Bible of God's law, of God's commandments and interjecting their own ideas and their own revelations and their own postulates of what God wants in our lives. And this is very, very damaging and it is very dangerous because when you begin to do that, you put your eternal destiny at risk because God is not going to be pushed around by men. He's not going to be pushed around by women. The only pushing that's got to go is you and me pushing against sin. Because I guarantee you, if you push against God, you're going to lose every single time. So let's get into this and see. Remember the word if, 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 if means that it is possible for you not to do this. And we need to understand some things here so that we can walk into things of God and grow. Now, notice what he says here. Let's go back up to the beginning of this. And he says, abide in me. Now, the word abide there is interesting because it's the word mino. And the word abide means to remain in and to dwell in and to live in. I want you to understand it. Abide means that you remain somewhere. You abide or you dwell somewhere or you live somewhere. So what now understand, where are we supposed to be living? Well, now notice what it goes on this word. It means a place where you are abiding or living or dwelling. Are you understanding? It means a state or a condition, the state and the condition of your life. That 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 you're abiding and that you're living in what state or what condition of life are you living in? Are you understanding this? It talks about what what kind of character are you abiding in? What kind of character are you dwelling in? What kind of character are you living in? And so we need to understand something here when this word talks about uh Abiding, it means to remain with someone and it means to be united with them. And it also means to be one with them in your heart, in your mind and in your will. Oh, my goodness. Listen to what this is saying here. So you got to remain in or with someone. We got to watch this now, be re united with them and also united with them. We have to be one in heart, one in mind and one in will. And, and the only way that this can be performed is we have to be steadfast and we have to persevere through this. So understand this now, this word abide here, it's very powerful. It talks about remaining. It, it talks about dwelling and it talks about living. Now, Jesus said, abide. So that means then that the place where he wants us to be living in, dwelling in, and remaining in is him. He said, abide in me. Now, I want you to understand something that when, when he talks about abiding in him, that means that every facet of our lives must be 
trusting in, living in, being steadfast in, and anchored in Jesus. I want you to understand this. See, when, oh, oh, help me to bring this forth, Holy Ghost. You have to understand something. That when you accept Jesus into your life, you don't accept him as Savior. He becomes your Savior but you accept him as Lord and master. I want you to get this. The book of Romans chapter 10 says that if thou shalt confess with the, thy mouth, the Lord, not the savior, Jesus, but the Lord, Jesus, he is Lord and he is master. He said, thou shalt confess with thy mouth, the Lord Jesus, and believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead then he said, thou shalt be saved. See, you're born again when you accept Jesus as Lord. When you accept him as Lord, then he saves you. Oh, come on, somebody. Unless you have made your mind up and made him your Lord in your mind and then confess that to him, he's not your savior. And I want you to understand something here. Jesus only accepts people who become his. And he becomes their Lord. He becomes their master and they become his servant. Now, this is this. This is not a popular message to the body of Christ. Because you have to understand what's going on here. Jesus said, abide in me. So that means if Jesus is Lord, then that means you've got to abide, you've got to live in, you've got to dwell in, you've got to be steadfast in and anchored in, you've got to be one with his mastery over you. Which means that Jesus is not asking for partial submission. He's talking about total submission which means he is Lord, he is master, and therefore our opinion is his opinion. You have to give your will over to him. It is no longer my will, but it is the will of the Lord. And this is where Christians have failed miserably. What Christians have done, and especially in the last few years, is Christians have morphed over into societal norms. And Christians are wanting to mask themselves the way society operates. They want to be accepted by society. They want to act like society. They want to talk like society. They want to, they even want to treat God like society. They want to, to take the word of God, the instruction manual of mankind, and then alter the word so that the word of God can begin to accept and to bring in and, and to include the lifestyle of sin that the world is living, the lifestyle of disrespect that of God that the world is living, the lifestyle of carnality that the world is living in. You see, the reason why is because God has told us in his word, he said the carnal man cannot receive the things of God, neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Can you see where we're going with this? See, when you as a Christian are trying to you're trying to assimilate the world system. You're trying to be uh, friends with the world and, 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 and servants of God. You can't do that because God said in his word that friendship with the world is enmity with, against God. In other words, when you become the world's friend, you become God's enemy because God's word is anti-world. It's anti-world system just like the world system is anti-Christ. So if you're going to befriend the world, 
and try to live like the world. You're going to try to abide in the world. You're going to try to connect your mind, your emotions, and your will with the same way that the world does, then you cannot abide in Jesus because they are diametrically opposed to one another. You cannot join the two together. There is no such thing as mixture with the world. The world is opposite of God. And this is where we're having problems. Jesus said, abide in me. I want you to get that. And, 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 and this, he says, he says, let your character and the condition of your character, how you act, let it live in me. Let it dwell in me. Let it remain in me. Now we need to understand something about Jesus. Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? In the beginning was the word. It's the word of God. And the word was with God. And the word was God. And all things that were made were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. And then the word says in John 1, 14, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So the word of God became human. So that, and what God was doing here in the Godhead manifesting himself in, in three separate and distinct personalities, what the Godhead did, what God did was he manifested himself in the body of a man to teach us how a man is supposed to obey and serve God how a man is supposed to submit to God. So you need to understand when Jesus says abide in me, you have to notice what the scripture says in first Peter, that Jesus has left us an example that we should follow his steps. So Jesus lived his life for 33 years on the earth. And for all of his life, he obeyed God. So he left us an example of how we could act. So when Jesus walked the earth, he showed us how we are to pray. He taught us how to live. He taught us how to honor God. He taught us how to deal with sin. He taught us how to deal with Satan and demons. He taught us how to deal with his own will concerning making his will line up in agreement with God's will. He taught us how to love one another. He taught us how to forgive. He taught us how to suffer. He taught, listen, he taught us how to wait on the Lord. You need to understand that Jesus, when he was in the earth, he taught us so many things. And he is the living word. So everything that Jesus lived, you can find it in the word because the word is the, watch this now, it is the verbal and the written manifestation of the life of God. And so he puts the word in written form for a record that cannot be eradicated so that we can always go back and see what the record says, what the word says. Because a lot of times when people are trying to remember what has been said, they get things all mixed up. But if it's written down and inscribed, then you have the absolute truth right there written so that you cannot, you cannot uh, go against it. You can't come against it. You must obey it because it, it is written there and you see it. So Jesus says, you got to abide in me. So that means if you have to live in Jesus, dwell in Jesus and be steadfast in Jesus, and then be in agreement with Jesus, with your spirit, soul, and body, with your mind, your will, your intellect, and your emotions, then that means you've got to be abiding in the word of God. So whatever God's word says, you got to live in it. Listen, what I'm saying, you got to live the word. Now, how many of us are living the word all the time? See, when you're really submitted to God, that submission is total submission. And what we have to do is we have to change how we're living. How much time do we spend in prayer? 
How much time do we spend in meditating the word? How much time do we spend in entertaining ourselves? How much time do we spend in studying the word and then altering our lives to match what the word says? And then the first thing that people will say, well, you know, I, I ain't got time to be doing all of that all that time. See, I got to work and I got to I got to come home, got to cook, I got to clean, I got to take care of this, I got a family and all that. L listen, let me tell you something right now. Your first master and your only master is Jesus. And unless you abide in him, because Jesus, the Bible says, listen to what the word of God says about Jesus in Colossians. It says in Christ are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So wisdom is the correct application of what your knowledge is so that you can gain the results that your knowledge tells you you should get. Well, in fact, if watch this now, if in Christ are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Then that means that the wisdom of God is hidden in Christ. The knowledge of God is hidden in Christ. So if you want the wisdom of God and the knowledge of God in order to be able to live, he will show you how to live. He will show you how to manage your time. He will show you how to put things in their proper perspective because we by ourselves are very, very, very poor at managing time, time management. We put things in the wrong place, the wrong perspective that we have of certain things. And so what we're going to have to do, the Bible said, examine yourselves to see if you be in the will of God. You've got to examine yourselves because a lot of times we start and, and see, as long as you're in the world, you're going to be hearing things of the world. You're going to interact with the world. And so the devil is always operating with your sin nature, always trying to alter your mind, change your mind. And it is very easy to fall under the spell of deception. Deception is such a powerful spirit that the devil uses to bring Christians and to captivate Christians into his control. And so Jesus is speaking to us and, 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 and you need to understand this. Go back to this. Now we're talking about the prayer of asking, but now there are some requirements of asking. He says, abide in me. Remain united with me in your heart, in your mind, and in your will, in your will, in your will. Your will has to remain united with Jesus. What is that saying, your will? That means the decisions that you make are united with the decisions that God wants you to make. Which means then that, that we never do anything outside of what God is telling us to do. Well, now, come on, apostle. Now, that's, now you, 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 that's, that's too much pressure. No, it's not. It's not too much pressure. It's, it's how much do you love the Lord? Because, see, Jesus said, I do always those things that please my father. So Jesus said, I always do the things that please my father. He said, my meat is to do the will of him. He said, my food is to do the will of him that sent me. See, that's the kind of mentality we have to have. But see, we, we, we want to put that kind of submission and we want to put that kind of, 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 of care into the things of the world. But you got to put it in God. See, when you put your trust and you put your total submission in Jesus, then Jesus through the Holy spirit knows how to release wisdom and he knows how to release knowledge so that you can effectively manage your life the way God wants you to manage it so that you can get maximum result out of every area of your life. What we're doing is as soon as something uh, makes a noise in our lives, we spend all of our attention on that. And we forget about the source of the solution, who is Jesus. The word of God, the living word, the manifested word. And we need to understand this now because it is very important.
Now notice what he says here. Abide in me. Did you get that? That means you got to persevere. That word means to persevere. Now that means if it means persevere, that means you're going to have to work at this. I'm going to have to work at this because everything in the world is going to be working on pulling us away from abiding in him, abiding in the word, abiding in that union, that one relationship with Jesus. Remember what the Bible said now in Amos three and three, how can two walk together except they be agreed? You can't walk with Jesus unless you're agreed with Jesus. And when you agree with Jesus, then your steps are going to be ordered by the Lord. You're going to walk where the Lord tells you to walk. Not only are you going to walk where he tells you to walk, but you're going to walk as fast as he tells you to walk at the pace he wants you to walk. And he's going to show you when to do the walking. So in other words, Jesus is going to master all of your time. And don't think just because I said Jesus is going to master all your time. That means you can't enjoy life. The Bible said God has given us richly all things to enjoy. So he wants us to, to enjoy life. He's given us the earth. He's given us the world. He wants us to enjoy it. But the problem is we're loving the things of the world more than we're loving God. We're loving the, the pleasures of the world more than we're loving God. Therefore, we can never get the maximum enjoyment of the things of the world. Neither can we get the maximum pleasure of the things of the world because we're not doing it God's way. Remember, God made the world for us. He did not make it for Satan. He did not make it for people who would be rebellious of him against him. He made it for his children and he wants us to enjoy it. But because his children keep wanting to do the things that the world is doing in the world, then we can never get the revelation of the true resources that God has placed in the earth for us so that we can own the resources and then enjoy the resources the way God wants us to. See, the devil has deceived us into thinking that if you live your life the way Jesus wants you to live it, total submission to him, then you ain't going to ever have any fun. Excuse my English, but you ain't going to never have any fun. That's what the devil tells you. But if you look at what the world is doing, everything that the world is enjoying, everything that the world is having fun in is killing them. And they don't even know it. It's, it's taking them into a slow death, physical death, sp spiritual death, emotional death. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Everything that the world enjoys, it kills them. And the devil's got them enjoying killing themselves. It's called satanic suicide. And this is what the devil is doing to many people. He's got you so caught up in, in, the, in the way he wants you to do things and that he wants you to enjoy it the way he wants you to do things. But the things that you're doing and enjoying are your destruction. Jesus said, I've got all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. If you want the goods of this world, come on, y'all. What did Jesus say? He said, why? Are you stressed out and worrying about what you're going to eat and what you're going to drink and wherewithal shall you be clothed? He said, clothed. He said, consider the lilies of the field, how they toil not, neither do they spin. He said, but Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed as one of them. He said, consider the fowl of the air. They don't, they don't, they don't gather and they don't store up anything yet. Your father feedeth them. And then he said, are you not much more? valuable than the sparrows. And then God said, if you would seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then all these things that the world asks for and wants and seeks after, he said, they'd be added unto you. See, you need to understand the deception is seek God, lose the pleasure. The truth is seek the kingdom and the pleasure is added. I hope you're understanding what I'm saying because we have been caught up in this worldly lifestyle. It is called spiritual and physical and emotional selfishness. 
It's all about me. It's all about me, how I feel, what I want, what I want to do. I ain't going to do all of that. I need my time. I need me time. Come on, y'all. Y'all know what I'm talking about. And so here we are finding ourselves when we start examining ourselves and, and examine yourself. How much have you rejected doing what God says? And I'm not talking about uh, getting into sin and killing somebody. I'm talking about meditating in the word. I'm talking about having a kind word to say to someone when they've wronged you. I'm talking about opening up your heart for forgiveness when you don't have anything but pain in your heart. But see, you can't forgive until you first let God heal you out of pain. But then in order for, for you to allow God to heal you out of pain, you've got to be open and honest with God and say, God, I was hurt. I was wounded. And only you can heal my broken heart. And I want it to be healed because I want to obey your word of forgiveness. But then when you think about who you got to forgive, then you start thinking, then the devil brings back up what they did to you and how bad they did it to you and how bad you feel. Then you, 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 you go back and say, well, I don't know about uh, doing all that forgiveness stuff right now. But you see, the forgiveness is not to release the people that did you wrong. Forgiveness is to get them out of your heart and to get the pain out of your heart so that you can go on. You may not ever see the person again. It doesn't matter. That's not the key. The key is you release them out of your heart so that God can go into your heart and take the pain out of you. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I pray that you're hearing what I'm saying because God wants you to understand this. He wants you to understand this truth. He wants you to understand his powerful revelation of truth. Praise God. I hope you're hearing what the Holy Ghost is saying. Praise the name of Jesus. Oh, thank you, Lord. This word is good today. And I want you to understand that because the power of God is moving supernaturally. The power of God is moving by his spirit. Praise God. I want you to hear that. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. The system, uh, it looks like the Internet is kind of slowing down a little bit and it's trying to reconnect. But praise God, we'll just keep going because we're re recording this. Praise the name of Jesus. So you need to understand God wants you and he wants me to walk in his revelation and in his power. And he wants us to walk in his authority. This is the will of God. This is the understanding that God wants us to have. He wants us to walk in his truth. He wants us to walk in his understanding. He wants us to walk in his righteousness and in his power. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I pray that you're, you're hearing the word and you're hearing what God is saying, uh, because this is so, so, so powerful. Praise the name of Jesus. I think we're just back on uh, back on uh, line on our Zoom account, at least. Praise God. So we'll just continue to teach on the word here because this is so powerful. And you need to understand this truth that God is speaking to us. It is such a powerful revelation of his truth. Now, I want you to see something that is so important here as we talk about this word that God has given us. Now, let's go back to the scripture here and see what the Holy Ghost is saying. He said, abide in me and I in you. Now, he says, not only are you to live in, and remain and dwell in me, he said, but then you got to let me. Uh oh, okay, here, here's the problem now. You got to let me abide in you. That means you got to let me come on, somebody. Remain in you, dwell in you. You got to let me live in you and through you. You got to let my state, and my condition rule you. Are you understanding that? You got to let me change your character. You got to become one with my heart, with my mind and my will. And you got to you got to let me persevere in you. Are you seeing what the Lord is saying here? You seeing what Jesus is saying here? He said, now you got to let me come inside of you. And let me do all the living in you. See, it's not just you got to abide in me. 
Because, see, this is what many Christians are doing right now. We're trying to live in Christ and live in the church and in the body of Christ without allowing Jesus to have authority and rulership in us. You can't have it like that. You can't be in Christ and not have Christ in you. You can't live in, abide in, and dwell in Jesus if you're not letting Jesus live in, abide in, and dwell in you. In other words, you have got to give your whole life over to him. That's why the scripture says, thou shalt love the Lord with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is what God wants us to do. We have to do this. It is so important for us to do this. We have to love the Lord with all of our heart, all our mind, all our soul and all of our strength. And we have to allow him to completely take over our lives. This is so important. He said, I have to also abide in you. So now understand this. If you're trying to abide in Jesus, but you're not letting Jesus have that reign and, and, and authority in you then there is no connection because see, there has to be an agreement. How can two walk together except they be agreed? So if you're not in connection with Jesus, but you're trying to connect with him, but you don't want him to connect with you. There's no, there's no agreement there. There's no synth synthesis there between you and him. He can't live in you. Then how can you live in him? It's impossible. So understand this, and I, I cannot, ex, I, I can't stress this enough. You and me, I have to do it. You have to do it. We've got to take an introspective view of how much of our lives do we want to give up so that we can serve the Lord. And when I'm talking about giving up our lives, I'm talking about the life that you live here on this earth. The Bible says in the Amplified, if you want to gain your higher spiritual eternal life, you have to lose your lower earthly natural carnal life. Jesus, you know, in the King James, it said, if you want to gain your life, you have to lose your life. You're gaining the higher life in God but you got to give up the lower life in the spirit, in the world. When you give up that lower life, that means you're giving Jesus access to abide in you. And when he comes to abide in you, then you're going to live the high life because that's the only kind of life Jesus knows how to live. That's the only kind of life that Jesus will live. It's the life that God has. And that's why it is so important for us to be obedient to the Lord. He, oh, come on and listen to what I'm saying. If we would be obedient to the Lord and allow him to take access and to control, it would become easy. Remember what Jesus said? He said, take my yoke upon you for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And if we're walking around with heavy burdens and we're walking around living a hard life, then where are we with God? Because Jesus said, my yoke, what ties you to me is easy. And the weight that you have to carry is light. Why is it that the weight that I have to carry is light is because the Bible said, casting all your cares upon him for he cares for you. All of your cares amplified says all your anxieties, all your fears, all your worries, cast them on him. So when you cast them on him, you're not carrying them anymore. So that means that you're light because you're trusting him to be the master and Lord of your life. You're trusting Jesus to take complete and total control over your life. And when you do that, you stop worrying about things. Oh, how, how, how have we been so guilty? The, maybe, maybe the reason why things are not happening for us at, at the time or the speed that they should is because we're not yet giving those cares to him. Oh, yes, we'll cast them on him when we get emotional and hear a good message or hear a good song. But then the next 25 minutes or the next day, here comes the devil with his thoughts. And, and guess what? We go right back and pick those cares back up 
and put that big heavy burden back on ourselves because we refuse to trust in the Lordship of Jesus to take control of our weights and our burdens and our carries, uh, our, our, our cares, and we carry them ourselves. And you are not equipped. You're not qualified to carry those weights. That's why Jesus took them. Because he's the only one that's equipped to carry those weights. Abide in me. Are you hearing this? Abide in me. And then you got to let me abide in you. Now notice what he says here. This is interesting. He says, as the branch, notice this, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can you except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same shall bring forth much fruit, for without me, you can do. And I want you to look at that word, nothing. Because that word, nothing, that's the word odious. It comes from the word, oh, meaning not. In heist, meaning one or not even one, not in the least. He said, you can do nothing. Not in the least, you can do nothing, not a thing. Absolutely nothing can you do without me. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And he places the emphasis on not even one or not in the least. In other words, he said, whatever you do, it is of no account. It has no weight. It has no value. And it surely has no authority. What is Jesus saying to us here? Jesus is saying, <laughs> he said, if, if you're trying to do stuff without me, it has no weight, no value, no authority. He said, you can do absolutely nothing without me. Anything that is kingdom oriented, if you are not allowing me to be connected to you, to strengthen, guide, lead, and direct you as your master and your Lord, you will do absolutely nothing. So this is the scenario. So if you don't do absolutely nothing, then that means your prayers have no account. Our prayers have no value. Our prayers have no worth because we're not connected to him. Now, Jesus gives us an example, and this is a very interesting example. He says, I am the vine and you are the branches. Let's take a look at this. Let's kind of go over this a minute. He says, now watch this. He says, as the branch in verse four, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can you except you abide in me. In other words, he's saying, when you look at a regular vine and you look at the branches that come up off the vine, he's saying the, 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 the branch can't bear fruit of itself. The branch does not have the ability or the power to produce fruit by itself. And he says, no more can ye except you abide in me. Then he goes on and he explains this. Now let's, let's see, because see, there's some deep stuff here that we need to, to unravel here. He says, I am the vine. Ye are the branches. He that abideth in me. He that abideth in me. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do zero. Nada, nils, not nothing, nothing, not a thing, absolutely nothing. Without me, whatever you do has no account, no weight, no value, no authority. You see what Jesus is doing here? He said, without me, you can do nothing. Now, notice what he says here. He says, I am the vine and you are the branches. Now, when you talk about a vine, if you notice a vine, when you see a vine and you see it, it is planted. And what is it planted in? It's planted in the earth. 
Now, I want you to get this now because this is the analysis that Jesus is giving us. He says, so the vine is what is planted in the earth. And then if you can look under the earth, you'll see coming out of the vine in the bottom of the vine are what we call roots. And these roots grow out and they extend out from the, 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 the vine itself so that the vine is growing straight up. But then the root systems are growing in a circular system system all the way around the vine. And based off of how big the vine is and how long the root system is that those roots can go out for a long, long, long period of time. And it can go actually a long distance and it can actually, the roots can be longer than the height of the vine itself. Now the roots are, watch this now, the conduits that the roots take out of the earth, the, the nutrients, the water, the nutrients, everything, the vitamins and everything that the vine needs to exist. The roots system takes it out of what it is planted in, which is it is planted in the earth. And so the earth itself has the nutrients that cause the vine to be able to live and to grow and to be the kind of vine that it is. So if it's a, if it's a, a, a watermelon vine, then the earth has the, the very nutrients and the water and all of the essential minerals to send through the root system for a watermelon. And so then when the root system sends the nutrients back through the root system, goes back into the vine, comes up the vine, and then as it comes up the vine, then every branch that is connected to the vine, when the, when the nutrients come up through the vine, if there is a connection with a branch to the vine, that means then that the vine has an opening for the minerals to come out of the vine and go into the branch. And so then that particular branch that's connected to the vine will have an opening for it to be fed and nourished. And then another vine is connected to it. There'll be another opening by the vine so that that branch can be fed and nourished. And if it has a thousand branches, there will be a thousand openings where each branch can have its own nourishment and fruit, uh, a nourishment for it so that it can produce the fruit that the branch is supposed to produce. Now understand the only reason why the branch can produce the fruit that it is supposed to produce is because it is getting the nourishment from the vine, which is getting the nourishment from the roots, which is drawing the nourishment from the earth, which was created by God to give the vine, the roots, the, 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 the roots, the vine and the branches, the nourishment for whatever kind of plant it is. So we're talking about divine connection here. And so this is why Jesus says what he says here. He says in verse five, I am the vine and you are the branches. And he says, if you abide in me and I in you, then you will bring forth much fruit for without me, you can do nothing. In other words, he says in verse six, if a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered and men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. See, what happens is when a branch gets disconnected from the vine, then the branch falls to the ground. Now, you got to understand something. And oh, listen to what the Holy Ghost is saying. So when the branch falls to the ground, it begins to wither and dry up. Now, why does the branch fall to the ground and wither and, and dry up? It withers and dries up because the branch doesn't have a root system. 
Once the branch gets disconnected from the vine, it falls to the ground. And because it doesn't have roots, it can't dig its roots into the earth and draw the nutrients because the branch was not made to have a root system. The branch was made to have a connection to the vine system. And so the branch was created by God to completely depend on the nourishment and the care from the vine itself. And the vine was created, watch what I'm saying, to get its nourishment from its root system and the root system gets its nourishment from the earth. Now, when you take this into a spiritual connection, Jesus is the vine and you are the branches. I am a branch. You're a branch. And notice Jesus's root system. Listen to what I'm saying now is the word of God. It is the promises of God. That's his root system. It is the word of God that speaks the promises of God. And so if that's the root system, then uh, the word is the root system. Then what is the earth? You know how the earth is. It gives the, 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 the nutrients to the root system. Well, what is, what gives the nutrients to the, the, the root system of Jesus? If the word of God is the root system, then what gives it its nourishment? The father through the manifestation of the Holy ghost. So the root system of the word is connected to and planted in the father. That's why the Bible says you are in him, in Christ, in him. We live in him. We move in him. We have our being. So you're watch this now because you, you have to understand the father is the spirit of life. He is the creator. So everything that we need comes from the father. That's why the Bible calls the father El Shaddai, the multiple breasted one, the one who is more than enough. He has enough to feed everything that he's created. And then the Holy Spirit takes, listen to what I'm saying. The Holy Spirit takes the power and the revelation of God, the nutrients of God, it is the spirit of God that then flows through, watch this now, from the father and goes into the root system or the word of God or the promises of God. And then the Holy Spirit sends the word and then releases revelation knowledge of what the word is saying that's coming from God. And then the revelation knowledge goes into the vine, which is Jesus. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And then Jesus has an opening in him for you that are connected to him so that the revelation that comes through the word of God coming by the Holy Spirit, coming from the source of the father flows into the opening in your heart because you're connected to the Lord. And then you're able to grow. And what the Holy Ghost gives you is the nutrients that make you who God called you to be. So if you're a prophet, then the nutrients for a prophet is going to be in you. And as long as you are connected to Jesus and be open to him and yield to him and let him be in you, he will continually feed you prophetic words. He'll continue to feed you prophetic gifts and cause you to come forth in the life that God has called you to be. If you're a truck driver, he'll, he'll keep releasing into you truck driving skills, truck driving ability. See, whatever God has called you to to do in the root system, the, 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 the source of life is God. The Holy Spirit flows the source of life through the root system, which is the word. And it is the Holy Spirit that releases revelation knowledge. Revelation knowledge is the blood. Oh, come on, somebody. It is the sap that flows through the vine. It is the sap that flows through the root system. And once it gets into Jesus, then Jesus, because we are connected to him and he has openings all through him so that he can release and feed us all. This is how we are supposed to live. So when you live like that, that means you never have lack. 
That means you never come behind in any gift. That means you never walk around in doubt, in fear, in worry, because you are always connected to the source of life. This is what the Lord is trying to get you to see. This is what he's trying to get me to see. Look at this. Watch this now. He said, if a man, verse six, abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. See, if you're not, see, if you're not connected to Jesus, then guess what? You're not connected to the Holy Ghost. You're not connected to revelation knowledge. You're not connected to truth. You're not connected to God. And so if that's the case, then you don't have anything to live. You don't have anything to feed you. So you're going to wither up and you're going to shrivel up. And then men are going to gather you and cast you into the fire and you're going to be burned. That's what a branch does. Once it loses its connection with the vine, it gets burned in the fire. You lose your connection with Jesus because you refuse to yield to him. You refuse to abide in him. You refuse to let him abide in you. Jesus said, look, I behold, I'm standing at the door and knock. If any man will hear my voice and open up the door, I will come in and sup with him and he with me. But if you don't, if you don't open that door, then you're going to be stuck out there. And guess what? You're going to wither up because the devil's going to work on you and he's going to wither you up so much until you are good for nothing. Oh, you'll be you'll be famous in the world. You'll have all the goods of the world. But spiritually, you're a skeleton. Spiritually, you're all shriveled up. And only use for you is to be cast into the fire and be burned. That's what Jesus has said. Listen, I'm trying to tell you, this is how we got to pray. Now, all of this has to take place before you open your mouth and start asking God for anything. He said in verse seven, if remember that word, if so all of the stuff that can happen, the flowing from the father by the Holy Ghost, the revelation going through the root system of the word. Come on, somebody. And the revelation knowledge being the blood and the life and the sap that goes through coming into the vine, who is Jesus, who has an opening for you because you're all in agreement with him. Then it gets flowed into you and then you will grow in Jesus and whatever God's called you to be. And you can do and and walk in the power of God. That's what he wants to happen. But it's only if you abide in him. And then he said, not only do you have to abide in me, he said, and then my words have to abide in you. My rhema, that word words means rhema, and that means to speak. It comes from the word rio, it means to speak. And it means that which is spoken, the statements that God speaks, the word of God, the word that's uttered by God's voice. Are you understanding what I'm talking about? This word also, a rhema, it talks about a prediction, a prophecy. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Things that God foretells. It's a promise from God. It's a command from God. Everything that God decrees out of his mouth, whatever God says, you remember what, uh, when, when, when Jesus was at the wedding and he was going to turn the water into wine and Mary said unto the, to the people, he said, whatever he tells you to do, do it. See the word, you got to listen to every command and, and receive his words and not only receive them and listen to them, but then obey them. This word rhema, it talks about a teacher teaching the word, teaching the doctrines by opening up his mouth and speaking or opening up her mouth and speaking. It's the promises and the doctrine that's revealed in the scriptures. It's everything that God pronounces. Now, understand something here. This word rhema, it talks about the subject matter of the word or the thing in which it is spoken about. It is specific words. Uh, and now understand this. Now understand this. When we're talking about Raymond, we're talking about specific words, the subject matter. Remember when I was telling you, whatever kind of fruit you are, whatever kind of fruit the vine is, like if it's a watermelon tree, then the earth has the nutrients for a watermelon 
so that the watermelon can grow. Then for a pear tree, it sends a different type of nutrients to a pear tree so that the pear tree can produce pears. Because remember when God created the earth, he said everything will produce after its own kind. That means it has its own nutrients and its own, um, uh, um, its own uh, vitamins in order for it to draw what it needs from the earth because the earth is filled with everything that every plant that is planted on the earth needs for its growth and so that that plant can have what it needs for its specific self. I hope you're hearing what the Holy Spirit is saying. Everybody's not called to be a preacher. Some are called to be doctors. Some are called to be lawyers. Some are called to be politicians. Oh yeah, they are. But if you're not connected to Jesus, then what's happening is you falling off the vine trying to be a politician and you're only getting fed by the devil. And that's why you're creating stupid and crazy and evil and wicked laws that go against the will of God. Hear what I'm saying. If you're supposed to be a, a man or a woman of God and a minister, then you got to stay connected to Jesus. If you don't want to hear Jesus and, 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 and be connected to his words, then you're going to fall off and you're going to be fed by the devil. And you're going to go into sorcery and divin divination and witchcraft. And you're going to be a devil worshiper and a warlock and a witch. And this is what the devil is doing. And then he's going to plant you in a so-called church and then have people coming thinking that they're hearing from God when you're speaking nothing but lies because you have a hypocritical spirit and you're moving by deception the same way he deceived Eve. Come on and hear what I'm saying. The devil uses that deception in men and women who call themselves preachers and prophets and apostles and evangelists and pastors. And they're going around in the church and infecting the church with lies and doctrines of devils. For in the last days, men will give heed to heat, to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, teaching lies and, and doctrines of devils and hypocrisy, operating disobedient to parents. Are you hearing what the truth breakers, haters of God, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God? Idolatry. This is what Jesus is getting across to us. Now, look at this as we close. For tonight, he says, now, if you abide in me and all of my words abide in you, then you will ask what you will and it will be done for you. You see that you can ask whatever you will and it will be done for you. Now, it's interesting because when you, when when he when he's talking about abiding in Jesus. He's talking about having fellowship with God. And, and I want you to understand something here that when God is talking to us about this, you have to understand when he says, and you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. That term, ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you in the Greek in which uh, this was written, it's written in the imperative mood. Now, what is the imperative mood that this is written in? When he says, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. That whole term is written in the imperative will. In other words, it is a command from the Lord. And so it's actually, what he's actually saying is, I command you to ask. Not that just said, you shall ask what you will. He said, I command you to ask what you will and it shall be done. Whatever you desire. He said, and God will meet the conditions of what you say. You see that? Because he wants to challenge you to ask him things so you can see how faithful God is to answer your prayer. That's what God is saying to us. He said, I'm challenging you to ask me and and I don't care what it is you ask me and I'm challenging you. I'm commanding you to ask me so that I can show you how faithful I am to answer your prayer. Now, the only reason why this can work is because we're living in fellowship with Jesus and our desires and our inclinations and our wants are his wants. That's why the word says, seek ye first the kingdom. If you seek the kingdom of God, all of these things will be added unto you. Ask. And it shall be done. Don't hesitate to ask. I command you to ask me. Are you hearing what I'm saying? This is prayer. 
This is commitment to God. For God to give such an open ended promise of you can ask whatever you will and it'll be done. God did not give that an open ended carte blanche to everybody. There was a condition tied to it. If you abide in him and he abides in you and if his words abide in you and that abiding, you understand what that means now then you have the lifestyle that changes your character, the lifestyle that you live in, the lifestyle that you abide in, that you steadfastly stay into and you persevere through. You yield to him. You listen to him. You obey him. He becomes your Lord and your master. Your desires are his desires and, and, and your likes are his likes. Then he says, you can ask me anything because you're going to only ask me the stuff that I want you to have anyway, and it will be done. So what we need to do is examine ourselves, people of God, and see whether or not we are in the faith. Are we seeking the Lord? Are we trusting in him with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, and with all of our strength? If we are, then Jesus, and he has made his promise to us, that we can ask whatsoever we will. This is the prayer of asking. Ask. But the only reason that you can ask is because you've sold yourself out to him. There are requirements. And if we fulfill those requirements, it's going to happen in our lives. Praise God. We'll see you next Thursday as we continue to pick this up and get deeper into the prayer of asking. Until then, be blessed of the Lord. Examine yourself to see whether you be in the Lord and in agreement with all that he wants you to be. Make sure that you allow him to be absolute Lord and master over your life. No more me, all him. He must increase and I must decrease. Then you can ask whatever you will. And God said, I command you to ask me and see how quick I'll answer your prayer. In Jesus' name, till next week, be blessed. Praise God.